It's a calzone, sir. Calzone, huh? Yeah, let's see it. Pass that on down. Let's get a little look at that. Bickstein wants a little taste. Come on, come on. Pass it down here. That's a good boy. Okay, let's see. Hey, what's in this thing? Uh, cheese, pepperoni, uh, eggplant. Uh, eggplant, huh? Mm, that's a hell of a thing. All right, all right. Back to business. Here you go. Very good, very good. Excellent, excellent little calzone you got there, Costanza. Okay, a little jealous. All right, here we go. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the calzones from Seinfeld. To all fans of Parks and Rec, do not worry. I will be exploring the locale calzone zone in a future episode. But before we do anything, I want to talk about one thing, or rather, two things. Pizza stones. Two pizza stones, one placed on the bottom rack of your oven, the other on the top. Or even better, a pizza steel on the bottom and a pizza stone on top creates a little oven within your oven, blasting your pizza or calzone with extra radiative heat from both the top and bottom. When the time comes, we're gonna preheat these in a maxed out oven for one hour before using. But well before then, we need to start making our dough. So into the bowl of a stand mixer goes 360 milliliters of tepid water, to which we're gonna add about three grams of active dry yeast, or about one teaspoon, and two grams, or about half teaspoon, of plain white sugar. This will be a nice little snack for our yeast while we let it bloom for 10 minutes before adding six 600 grams of bread flour, giving our dough a hydration of about 60%. You can use all-purpose flour, but I've found that it needs a higher hydration, more like 65-70%, and bread flour just produces a better texture in the final product. Anyway, you'll notice that I added about 6 grams, or 1 teaspoon of kosher salt, to the flour before kneading on medium speed for about 5 minutes, after which time we should have a tacky, supple dough, which we are going to pre-divide into our desired portions. Then we are stretching each divided portion into a taut ball, the rounder and more taut it is, the easier our job is going to be later on. Then we're going to engage in a practice employed by many New York pizza shops, which is making the dough ahead of time and allowing it to cold ferment in the fridge. These quarter recipes of the dough are perfect for individual pizzas, but for the calzone we need a double portion of dough, since it is effectively a double pizza. Double pizza, double pizza stones, double dipping. Coincidence? I don't think so. Into a well-oiled bowl it goes, covered with plastic wrap and refrigerated for three days. Cold fermentation accomplishes a number of things, all of which I will illustrate later on. For now, we gotta make a quick pizza sauce. We've done this a number of times on the show, so I'm just gonna breeze through it. Into the jar of a blender goes a 28-ounce can of San Marzano tomatoes, half a small chopped onion, two cloves of garlic, little shakes each of dried oregano, dried basil, and crushed red pepper flake if you want a little heat. Then we're hitting this mixture with one-second pulses until it is relatively smooth. Blasting it on high speed would incorporate air bubbles into the sauce, which is a bad thing unless you like orange pizza sauce. We're also going to season it with a little bit of kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, taste for seasoning of course, and then if all you're making is pizza, you're pretty much ready to go. I personally like my pizza sauce to do its cooking in the oven, but for the sauce that we're serving with the calzone, I want to cook it on the stove top for about 30 minutes, maybe with a little splash of water to prevent it from getting too thick. Since we're just going to be dipping our calzone in it, we want to cook off some of that raw tomato flavor and let it get a little sweet. Set that aside because now I'm going to demonstrate why cold fermenting is so important. Here we have the same recipe of that pizza dough, which I just made fresh and did not allow to cold ferment, just allowed to proof at room temperature for two hours. I'm going to start by generously flouring both it and my work surface, and then starting to roll it out. Mark Iacono taught me this method where you roll out two ends of it, leaving a sort of mound of unrolled dough in the middle, which you can then rotate and roll from the center. Thank goodness for visual aids, because my description of that was pretty confusing. We're then going to pass the dough repeatedly over our knuckles until gravity stretches it out to about a 10 inch round. And now to finalize our pie, we need to prep our pizza peel, dusting it with a little bit of coarsely ground cornmeal, which is going to allow our pizza to slide off it and into the oven with ease. Take care of any final shaping and stretching, and then it's time to sauce and cheese. Atop the pie goes a few generous dollops of our raw tomato sauce, which we're going to spread almost all the way to the edges. Then I'm going to hit this guy with some thinly sliced, full-fat, fresh mozzarella. Our oven has been preheating at 550 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour, so this pizza is going to cook really quickly. Mine came out like this in about five minutes and you might notice that it's pretty thin and unimpressive. It's flat, there's no blistering or bubbling, one might even call it cracker-like. The double stone setup did a great job of charring the bottom just like a real pizza place, but let's see what happens when we use our cold fermented dough. At this point, more gluten has developed, which is going to improve the dough's texture. It has lightly fermented, which is going to improve its flavor. And as you can see, the yeast has been much more active, creating a much better rise in the crust and giving us those nice bubbles and charred spots that we've come to expect from Pizzeria Pizza. You can definitely 
simply make quick pizza dough without fermenting. Just triple the yeast in the recipe and don't expect it to look so nice or taste so good. Anyway, now that we've got our pizza dough down, it's time to do do geez. It's time to tackle our calzone. George specifies three different fillings, one of which is eggplant, which I'm going to start by slicing and placing on a rack set and rimmed baking sheet and lightly salting both sides with kosher salt. This is not only going to season our eggplant, it's going to make it weep bitter tears, literally. After about 30 minutes, you will notice a conspicuous brown liquid has materialized atop your eggplant slices. We're just going to dab that off with a paper towel, maybe give the paper towel a little taste to prove that it is in fact bitter. It is. That was a little dramatic though, so tone it back next time and make sure you dab both sides of the eggplant. Next, I'm going to do what I should have done before and line my sheet pan with aluminum foil for easier cleanup, pop the rack back on top, and get ready to roast. First, I'm going to season these guys with a little bit of freshly ground black pepper and a few healthy glugs of olive oil, which is going to help both flavor and coloring. Then these fellows are headed into a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 20 to 25 minutes until they're nicely browned and soft. Set them aside to cool off a bit, and then they're ready for a litany of roasted eggplant applications, including but not limited to calzone filling. I'm a little worried about long strands of eggplant slipping out of my calzone though, so I'm going to go ahead and chop these into more manageable pieces. And at long last, we are ready to make some folded in half pizza. We've got our cold fermented dough here that we're going to let sit at room temperature for two hours or until it has doubled in size. Then, doing our best to maintain its roundness, we're going to retrieve it from the bowl, coat it liberally with flour on both sides, and then roll it out using the same method as before. And remember that this is double the dough of the previous individual pizzas, so it's going to be considerably larger. We're going to use the same knuckle over knuckle method to stretch it out about as wide as we can get it. After all, New York pizzerias are known for many things. Small calzones are not one of them. Now, on the interior half of this circle, we're going to start spreading a whole bunch of high quality ricotta, making sure to leave a two to three inch gap on the outside. Next up, we are shingling that with some pepperonis, topping our pepperonis with our chopped roasted eggplant, and then topping that with just a whole lot of thinly sliced fresh mozzarella cheese. And then it's time to turn our toppings into fillings. Fold the dough right over, trying to drape instead of stretch, and then we're going to seal this whole affair shut by simply using a pizza cutter to trim off the excess. No egg wash, no butter, no muss, no fuss. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pizza cutter, optional. We're just going to pinch the edge shut a little bit to make sure that it's totally sealed. I'm going to tuck in the calzone tips a little bit, just to make sure that it fits on my pizza peel, which I am of course going to dust with coarsely ground cornmeal. Place the calzone on top, make any last minute adjustments. I'm going to turn it around so the thicker part is facing the hotter part of my oven. And then it's time to shimmy this guy betwixt our two stones for what could take anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes depending on your oven's hotness. Then we're going to immediately slice this guy in half, which prevents the steam from making the crust soggy from the inside out, and take a look at a seriously cheesy calzone cross section, marred only by the buildup of liquid you can see around the bottom of the zone. The calzone, while still absolutely delicious, has fallen victim to over-moist artisanal fillings. And while it is an obvious and undisputed member of the Clean Plate Club, the milky whey or whatever it is is bumming me out something fierce. So let's see if we can't take a few simple steps to reduce the moisture inside our zone. That, as a sentence, does not sound great. First, we're going to drain some whey out of the ricotta by lining a sieve with four layers of cheesecloth, setting that whole affair in a bowl, dumping in the ricotta, covering with plastic wrap, and draining overnight. Alternately, you could weigh it down with something heavy like a jar and let that squeeze the moisture out of the ricotta for 20 to 30 minutes. Next up, I'm going to use shredded full-fat low-moisture mozzarella. Lay down a little insulative layer on the thinner side of the dough round. Take note that this plastic wrap really loves cheesecloth. Take a look at our bounty. That's not much, but it's a few tablespoons that won't end up in our calzone. And continue as before, layering toppings, folding the whole thing closed, sealing shut with a pizza cutter, and dumping the whole thing into our oven that's been maxed out and preheating for one hour. And that is looking just about awesome. I'm going to bust out the mezzaluna this time so I look like an adult, cutting open my giant pizza pocket, and was relieved to see right away that our moisture problems were no more. There's a bit of doming going on on the inside of the calzone, but for the most part, we've reached the apex of the art form here. I've had a lot of pizza and calzones recently, so I'm going to cut this into fourzies for sharesies. Briefly admire the molten cheese inferno before using it immediately to burn my mouth. The bottom's got a little bit of char, but I'm actually into that, and the whole thing is just awesome. Go make one now, or rather in three days. Sorry about that.